Okay. Um, okay. What is the So, um, hi everyone. Welcome back to the um, to the uh, afternoon session. So we'll have two very exciting talks. The first one will be given by Sifo Chui, uh, who's a PhD student at MIT of Philippe Bolle, and he will uh, tell us about the improved dimension dependence for Mala and all about yes. concept. Yes. So Sifo, uh, please. <laughs> Hey, uh, hi everyone, I'm Sinho, and today I'll be talking about uh, improved dimension dependence for MALA and lower bounds for sampling. So this is all uh, joint work with my wonderful collaborators, Kwang Jun An, Patrick Gerber, Chen Lu, Zhang Cheng, Thibault Le Guic, and Philippe Rigolet. So Kwang Jun, Thibault, and Philippe are all here at Simons. All right, so one of the reasons why researchers are so interested in sampling nowadays is because there's this amazing connection between the fields of optimization and sampling. Namely, in optimization, what we want to do is we want to optimize an objective function f, and in sampling, we want to sample from a target distribution pi. So throughout this talk, pi is always going to have a density e to the minus v on Rd. And this, this function v is called the potential of the distribution, and it's analogous to the objective function in optimization. So inspired by this connection, uh, researchers have, on one hand, tried to bring in the extensive toolkit of reliable algorithms from optimization to the world of sampling. For instance, optimization has all these algorithms such as gradient descent, mirror descent, proximal gradient descent. I could even add to this accelerated gradient descent, coordinate descent. And for each of these algorithms that I just mentioned, we now have a sampling analog of it. So we have Langevin, mirror Langevin, and so forth. So this part of the story where we try to bring in algorithms from optimization to the sampling problem has been largely a success story and one that's still ongoing. On the other hand, there's another aspect of optimization, um, which is that it has a very refined uh, non-asymptotic theory of complexity. And the analogous story for sampling is still much less understood. And this is sort of what my talk is going to focus on. You know, let's start by uh, formulating this complexity question a, li a little more precisely. So the, the notion of complexity I'm, I'm considering in this talk is that of query complexity. Okay, so I'm going to allow you to make queries to the potential V and also its gradient, uh, grad V. And we want to know how many queries are required uh, to this oracle in order to output an approximate sample from the target distribution. Okay, so in this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on sort of the, the simplest, the most canonical case, which is that uh, I'm going to assume that this potential is strongly convex and smooth and kappa is going to denote its condition number. So what we want is we want a description of this, of the complexity of sampling from this class of distributions in terms of the relevant parameters of the problem, which are the dimension, the condition number, the accuracy epsilon and so forth. And I haven't yet specified what metric we're looking at, but you can think like uh, this question is interesting for any of the, the standard metrics that we look at, total variation, Wasserstein, et cetera. Okay, so, th so this is going to be the complexity question we look at today. And a, a quick outline of what, what my talk is going to focus on. First, I'm going to look at this complexity problem from an upper bound standpoint. So I'm going to try to really understand the complexity of one family of algorithms, namely the family of metropolis adjusted algorithms. We're going to see that this family of algorithms is very interesting to study for many reasons. It's a widely used in practice. It's sort of the key to unlocking high accuracy guarantees for sampling, yet it, it's much less understood than their counterparts which are algorithms based on discretizations of stochastic processes. But after really uh, spending most of my time on, on like how we can understand, better understand the complexity of this particular algorithm, in the last part of my talk, I'll just briefly um, describe what we could say about more general sampling algorithms. All right, let's uh, jump right into it. What is a, a Metropolis-Hastings algorithm? So a Metropolis-Hastings algorithm proceeds by first initializing a point drawn from uh, the initial distribution mu zero. And at each step, we're going to repeat these two, two steps. First, we're going to propose a new point, yn plus one, from some uh, probability kernel. This is called a proposal kernel. And this kernel is something that I'm allowed to choose as part of my algorithm. Then we take this proposed point and we accept it with some probability that's written here. And just to be clear about what I mean, um, if we accept, then what that means is that 
the next iterate of our algorithm is going to be the proposed point yn plus one. Otherwise, if we don't accept, then the next iterate of our algorithm is just the, the previous iterate. Okay, so the nice thing about this, um, this accept reject step is that really like no matter what the proposal kernel is, uh, this accept reject step will ensure that the stationary distribution of this Markov chain is going to be the correct one, pi. This allows us for great flexibility in choosing what this proposal kernel should be. And of course, like the better that our kernel is suited to this sampling problem, the better the resulting algorithm is going to become. Okay, so let's see some examples of these uh, Metropolis Hastings algorithms. So the, the first example is almost the simplest thing you could do, which is at, if I'm at a point X, I'm just going to propose a Gaussian, which is centered at my current point. I'm really just doing a complete random walk on my state space, occasionally accepting or rejecting my points. That's a metropolized random walk. Of course, you could do something a little bit smarter, which is uh, this uh, metropolis suggested Langevin algorithm or MALA, which now uses uh, gradient information to construct its steps. So where MALA comes from is that this kernel is one step of discretization of the Langevin process. So uh, as many of you know, the Langevin process is a continuous time stochastic process whose stationary distribution is pi. And this is uh, given by one step of a discretization of this stochastic process. Now, once, uh, once you discretize this stochastic process, you're going to introduce bias. So the stationary distribution of the discretized process is no longer equal to pi. So what this algorithm is saying is, okay, we, we discretize, but then now we add this extra uh, filtering step to, in order to correct for this bias and return us to the correct stationary distribution. So that's MALA. And you can consider more complicated things. For instance, um, here we have a metropolized HMC where the proposal is given by k steps of a leapfrog integrator of the continuous time uh, Hamiltonian dynamics. So I won't talk much about HMC in this talk, but I just want to note here that the case of k equals one step corresponds precisely back to MALA. Okay, so what, what can we say about these algorithms? So the good news is, as I mentioned before, this filtering step automatically ensures we have, we have the correct stationary distribution. Now, if you have a Markov chain with the correct stationary distribution, you can kind of expect it under general circumstances to converge geometrically to its stationary distribution. Hence, we get a very good dependence on the accuracy parameter. We, we usually get polylog one over epsilon dependence on the accuracy. This should be in contrast with uh, discretizations of stochastic processes. Which usually get more on the lines of poly one over epsilon dependence. And so these metropolis Hastings filters are really our key to getting high accuracy guarantees for sampling. And they're extremely widely used in practice. However, they're actually much less understood than discretizations of stochastic processes. And that's really because in the definition of the algorithm, we accept certain steps with, uh, with a certain probability. And to understand the performance of this algorithm, we kind of need to control this acceptance probability. But it's not very clear how, how we can best do this. And so what, what's sort of known non-asymptotically about this family of algorithms? So these, these are the state of the, result, uh, state of the art results that I'm aware of. All these rates here I'm showing are just under the assumptions that I listed at the beginning of my talk, just strong convexity and smoothness. So if you assume like more assumptions, you could get better rates, but this is sort of the, the state of the art. Now, one thing I want you to notice here is that, okay, you can like improve the condition number dependence a little bit, but all of these rates are bottlenecked at D dimension dependence, which is quite large. If you think about it, it's kind of curious because Metropolis random walk, it's doing the most naive thing possible. Just a complete random walk on my state space, accept or reject occasionally. MALA is using gradient information, so it's smarter. And HMC is more sophisticated yet. However, all of these just get D dimension dependence. Okay, so is this fundamental? Are we missing something here? Of course, you can look at any upper bound rate and ask if it can be improved, but 
uh, do I actually have a reason for believing that these rates can be improved? Okay, so there's this uh, classical literature, which I'm going to refer to as the diffusion scaling heuristic. And this goes back to Roberts and Rosenthal in 98. And this is what they showed. If you run MALA with the target distribution being a product distribution, and you choose the step size to scale with the, with the dimension, I'm going to choose the explicit scaling L over D to the one third for the step size. Then you can consider the high dimensional limit as, as the dimension D tends to infinity. And it turns out that the algorithm MALA converges to an infinite dimensional Langevin diffusion with a certain speed, which is explicitly given in terms of this L. Okay, and this speed is uh, non-trivial. Okay, so this result assumes more than uh, what I described at the beginning of my talk. It requires like some more uh, higher order regularity on B. In particular, like you need some, uh, some bounds on the third derivative of B. But anyway, what, what is the takeaway of this result? Well, if step size one over D to the one third leads you to a non-trivial limit process, then they concluded that the dimension dependence of MALA under in this setting should actually be D to the one third. Okay, and uh, I'll just mention like one reason why this, this work has been so influential is because um, it gave very specific actionable advice to practitioners on how best to choose the step size of MALA. Okay, but as you can see, there's, there's quite a gap between this line of work, which gets D to the one third, and the best non-asymptotic results, which were all the way up at D. So, you know, some natural questions that arise from this are like, is this improved rate an artifact of the fact that we're looking at some kind of asymptotic regime? Like, what can we improve our non-asymptotic rates and, and so forth? Okay, so now I'm going to describe our, our main result, which gets somewhere in between. Okay, and this is what it says. We have an additional assumption, which is a warm start condition. That is, you need to initialize MALA at a distribution mu zero which is not too far away from the target distribution pi in the sense that this density ratio is uniformly bounded. And then under this kind of assumption, we, we obtain an improved mixing time bound for MALA, which now scales as square root D times polynomial factors in the condition number in log one over epsilon. And we can get this result in any of the standard metrics, TV, W2, KL, chi squared, and so forth. Okay, so the next part of my talk, I'm going to kind of dive into the technical details of this result. So before that, this would be a good chance to answer any questions about the setting. What is empirically that is numerically observed? What is the uh, expectation? Is it really that it's going to be independent of dimension? Yeah, so empirically, like for nice distributions, you do observe this uh, D to the one third behavior. Um, although I should say like the experiments are more about the acceptance probability. So you, you scale the step size one over D to the one third, and you see that you're accepting most of your steps. And that like heuristically tells you that this is a, a good step size choice to, to make. It's a bit harder to like test experimentally what the, the mixing time is. So the warm start, is it easy to construct or do you just assume it? No, so the, the warm start is an issue and I, I want to like get back to this point later. So what do you currently have if you are, uh, if you just, if you just fit it by a Gaussian? You mean for the warm start? Yeah, if you remove warm start and replace that, if you start with the Gaussian, with, with some fixed uh, network. Yeah, so uh, I'll explain this a bit more later, but uh, if we call this quantity M0 for the warm start parameter, then using an appropriate Gaussian, then uh, you can get uh, initialization with M0 satisfying kappa to the D over two. Yes, okay, so the scales exponentially in the dimension. Our result uh, scales is uh, poly log M0. So you can see like uh, with this initialization, our result is going to incur extra factors of the, of the dimension. That makes sense, thank you so much. All right, so now I'm going to talk about like the, uh, give you like a proof sketch of, of this result. So I'm going to start with sort of like basics about uh, Markov chain mixing. 
To, this, to do this, I need to introduce the idea of conductance. Okay, so let capital T denote the probability kernel of the algorithm MALA. And the conductance of this chain is going to be defined as this ratio. It's like, if given any subset S, I'm going to look at how much mass is flowing from S to S complement, and I'm going to normalize it by the, the mass that pi puts on S. So what this definition is looking at is, it's looking for the presence of bottlenecks in your space. So for instance, if my space looks something like this, then uh, it would take a really long time for this Markov chain to mix because it'd be hard for you to get across these two components. So that's essentially what this definition is capturing. And uh, there's some classical theory, Cheegers inequality, which relates the conductance to the spectral gap. And via this, you can uh, convert this lower bounds on the conductance into uh, Markov chain mixing time results. In particular, the mixing time is going to be like one over the conductance squared. For our result, we need a slight uh, generalization of this, which is just S conductance. So in S conductance, the main difference is that I impose a lower bound on the probability of events that I'm considering. Essentially, like the only events I care about now are, are those that um, are sufficiently probable under pi. And this lets us like not have to worry about events that will kind of never happen under pi. Okay. Um, so with this definition, you can still show, and this is a result of Lovash and Simonovitz, that uh, you can still bound the mixing time via the S conductance, where this parameter S has to be taken to be the accuracy divided by the, the warm start parameter. This will, I guess, become uh, more important later. So now that I introduced conductance, like the, the main question for approving mixing time bounds for Markov chains is, how do we lower bound the conductance? And this is kind of a standard lemma that's used to uh, lower bound the conductance. What it says is that if I can prove that for all pairs of points X and Y, uh, which are distance at most R from each other, if I can get a bound on this TV distance between TX and TY, okay, so TX is, this is the kernel started at X. And similarly for TY. Okay, if I can bound this TV distance, then it implies a lower bound on the conductance. So I'll just give you a quick uh, intuition about why this is true. So, okay, so remember that conductance is about encouraging like mixing across these cuts. So suppose I have some cut S and S complement. Okay, the, the first step is just going to be, we use some isoperimetry property of pi. So it's uh, well known that if pi is strongly log concave, then it's going to satisfy some isoperimetry properties. And what isoperimetry is going to imply is that most of the mass under pi is going to lie near the cut. Sorry, near, I guess, the boundary of the cut. Like in, in this region, um, pi is going to put most of its mass there. Now, uh, this is, by the way, where, where this comes in. This alpha is the strong well concavity constant. So that's where we use, use that property of pi. Now, the second step is just the, the assumption of the lemma. So the assumption of the lemma says that if I have two points x and y that, that are close to each other, then the, the TV distance is bounded by three fourths. So let's say I had two points here. This was X and this is Y. And they're, they're within distance at most R from each other. Then I claim that this assumption of the lemma implies that X has to send mass to S complement and Y has to send mass to S. So it has to mix. Well, why is that? Like, Imagine if X only sent mass to S and Y only sent mass to S complement, then the TV distance between the kernels would be one rather than uh, bounded by three fourths as the lemma says. Okay, so this assumption of the lemma in encourages mixing across the cuts. Okay, so we had this, um, this conductance lemma. We need, a, again, a, a slight generalization of this to, to, to lower bound the S conductance rather than the actual conductance. Working with S conductance, uh, the nice thing is that we don't really need to check this, this condition for all pairs of points X, Y. 
we only need to check them for pairs of points x, y, which um, are like high probability under the, the distribution pi. So this is now going to be our goal is to bound this overlap, which is just a TV distance between Tx and, and Ty. Okay, so how do you bound this? Um, well, this is the, the standard way is that like you use the triangle inequality and you bring in Q, which is the proposal kernel. Okay, so now we have these three terms. This middle term, which is just bounding the overlap between the proposal kernel, this is actually very easy to bound. Okay, if you think about what the Langevin proposal is, it's just a Gaussian distribution centered at some point. So this is like the uh, TV distance between two Gaussians and it's like straightforward to control. The real difficulty is how do we control the first and third terms, which are bounding the difference between T and Q. Let me just remind you that Q here, this is the proposal, and T, which is the, the kernel of the algorithm, this is the proposal plus the accept reject filtering step. So the difference between T and Q, it's really just uh, capturing the effect of this filter. In other words, it implicitly contains information about the acceptance probability of your chain. In order to upper bound this TV distance, you kind of need to lower bound the acceptance probability of your chain. Indeed, that's sort of where the previous analyses got stuck is because uh, it was hard to control this acceptance probability by hand unless you take the step size quite small. In fact, even the diffusion scaling literature that I mentioned earlier, what they rely on is like a seven, seventh order Taylor expansion of the acceptance probability and careful control to, to get their results. Okay, but like the acceptance probability is a fundamental part of this algorithm. Like you can't really run away from it. At some point in your analysis of it, you have to confront the acceptance probability. Or do you? So now I'm going to talk about the, the new idea that we introduced to, to analyze this chain. And it rests on this projection characterization of Belair and Diaconis. And what it says is that if I have here, this is going to be the space of all reversible Markov chains with stationary distribution pi. Then this Metropolis Hastings kernel T, this is actually the projection of the proposal kernel onto this space. With, a, uh, with respect to some appropriate metric that I'm not really going to describe here. Okay, and in particular, what that means is, is if I had another, another kernel Q bar here, then it's only farther away from Q than T is. Okay, so that was a bit informal, but precisely what this theorem implies is that I can bound this TV distance between T and Q in terms of the TV distance between Q and Q bar. Now there's an extremely natural choice of Q bar for this problem because Mala, the proposal was obtained as a discretization of the continuous time Langevin process. So I'm actually going to take Q bar to be the continuous time Langevin process run for time H. And this is indeed a reversible Markov chain with stationary distribution pi. Okay, so now we just have to bound the difference between Q and Q bar. And this, in effect, this reduces the study of Mala to a, a pure question in discretization. How close is the discretization of Langevin from uh, the Langevin itself. Why do you have this two here? Uh, why, why do I have a two here? So this is kind of a technical point having to do with what the distance is that this theorem is talking about and the fact that T is an atom. But it's like, it won't really matter for, for this talk because uh, we, we just have to control these terms anyway. So it just ends up being another constant factor. Okay, so there's one loose end here that, uh, which is that, Precisely this statement I wrote here, it only controls this TV distance and expectation, whereas we really need it with high probability. Okay, but this can be handled. We, we prove a, an extension of this projection theorem, where here, like, now you give me any increasing convex function phi, and I can bound the expectation of phi of the TV distance between T and Q in terms of quantities involving only Q and Q bar. So with the presence of this convex function, now you can write down some concentration inequalities. So for, um, I guess for experts, like you might see like how to complete this argument. Like if I wanted to bound this TV distance, 
I can bound it by the KL divergence. Then you can use your Sonov theorem from stochastic calculus. And you can bound it essentially by a term that looks like this. And this turns out to just be of order h squared d. It turns out the KL divergence is not quite enough for our purposes. We need to bound something stronger. But anyway, the tool is still Gersonov theorem and, and uh, standard arguments of discretization. And what this h squared d tells you is that in order to control this term, you need to take the step size h to be smaller than 1 over square root d. And this is where our mixing time bound comes from for a model. Okay, quick recap. Um, so we've improved the dimension dependence from D uh, to square root D under this extra assumption of a warm start. And in the process, we introduced this new technique for studying these metropolis Hastings chains, which just like reduces down to classical questions of discretization of stochastic processes, which is much more well understood. Okay, so um, there's a couple of questions that arise from this. Uh, the most obvious question is, uh, we had this extra assumption of having a warm start. Can this assumption be removed? And as I mentioned um, before, like uh, if the only thing I tell you about pi is that it's strongly log concave and log smooth, then the, this warm start dependence introduces extra factors of dimension in the bound, so it's uh, undesirable. And another question is, like, is our analysis tight? Can you do even better than, than squared? Okay, so the, both of these questions were sort of uh, answered in later works, or at least like later works started to address these questions. There's this paper by Yin Tat Lee, Roti Shen, and Kevin Chan. Uh, Kevin will be speaking about this like right after, right after this talk, actually. Um, and what he shows is that there exists initializations such that the warm start parameter is exponential indeed, such that Mala, when you initialize with that, that uh, distribution, the mixing time is lower bounded ID. So what does this tell us? This tells us that warm start is actually necessary <coughs> to get our improved rates of O tilde square root D. Okay, and this is a little bit fundamental. Like the, the reason why we're able to get these improved rates is because we take an aggressive choice of step size. Now this choice of step size is fine if you're close to pi, but if you happen to start far away from pi, this uh, choice of step size will lead you to rejecting a lot of your steps, and then you'll incur like a poor mixing time uh, bound for a mop. So really the, the thing to do here is not try to remove the assumption of warm start from our analysis, but rather like find ways to algorithmically produce a warm start. And this isn't a hopeless task. There are some actually like promising approaches for getting this warm start algorithmically, but it's still sort of like work in progress. I also mentioned that uh, there's a Yuan Si's talk later in this workshop on Thursday. And there, the, the claim is that kappa, uh, kappa times square root D is the tight rate for mala under a warm start. I'm very excited to, to hear this talk. And uh, I, I guess this would imply that our analysis is tight under in this warm start regime. So I've talked about our results for Mala. And in particular, I've talked a little bit about what's known about lower bounds for Mala. But it'd be really great if we could do something beyond just a algorithm-specific algorithm lower bound and say something about all sampling algorithms. So that's what I'll try to talk about next. But um, I, I won't be really able to give you more than just a, a short teaser of, of this stuff. OK, so. Here's the, the question, which is, can we prove lower complexity bounds for sampling? This is, uh, yes, you have a question? Just um, to understand better. Um, so even with the warm start, you can, so d to the one third, right? That you're saying, basically your work and the lower bounds show that you cannot get it, right? Yeah, so this d to the one third actually has some like stronger assumptions, like higher order regularity. So. Uh, my current feeling is that the these higher these like extra assumptions enable like a faster rate. Yes. Okay, 
Okay, so this question of lower complexity bounds, for example, and this is an analogy to this uh, theory of Oracle complexity and optimization, which was initiated in seminal work by Nemirovsky and Yudin. Um, and I hope that it's sort of clear, like why we want to look at this lower bound question. Like this lower bound question, besides characterizing the fundamental difficulty of this task of sampling, without it also helps us with algorithm, algorithm design. If we don't really have any lower bounds, then we'll never really know if our, our current algorithms are optimal or not. Okay, so there, there have been some efforts towards this question, but none of them have really directly answered this, this question. Let me just briefly describe. So there's a family of, of papers on algorithm specific lower bounds. I already talked about, a bit about Mala. There's this paper by Kaolu and Wang, which gives a lower bound for how well you can discretize a specific stochastic process. So I fix a process like overdamped Langevin process or underdamped Langevin process. And this word tells me how close can I come to actually simulating the, the, that stochastic process. But um, this doesn't really tell us if that stochastic process itself is optimal. And it doesn't really give lower bounds for other algorithms, such as MALA or HMC or whatnot. Okay, so there, that's um, algorithm specific works. There's this paper by Chatterjee, Bartlett, and Long. And what they do is they give tight rates for this, this complexity question, but with a stochastic gradient oracle rather than uh, actual gradient oracle. So their lower bound is. Uh, mostly about overcoming the noise of the stochastic gradient oracle and therefore doesn't really give a lower bound for the original sampling question I pose. And finally, we have this paper by uh, Ronggi, Hoden Lee, and Zhang Feng Lu on uh, estimating, they, they give a lower bound on estimating the normalizing constant of a probability distribution. But it turns out that this lower bound doesn't actually imply any lower bound for the sampling task itself. So in short, there, there wasn't really any works directly for, for this question before our work. So now I'll describe like our, our progress towards this question, which is we managed to characterize the query complexity of sampling in one dimension. And we find that the, the tight rate is log log kappa. Okay, so a couple of remarks about this result. So specifically our performance criterion is being able to sample to within one over 64 in TV distance. This is sort of an arbitrary number. Um, our lower bound holds for any kind of local oracle. In particular, like the upper bound is achieved only using potential queries and all the higher derivatives aren't, don't really help you for this problem. And our upper bound is uh, achieved via rejection sampling algorithm. So I, I'll just briefly describe like what's the strategy of the, of the proof. So we construct a family of distributions, um, holographic P, with the following two properties. The first property is if I have an algorithm that will output a single sample from a distribution in this family, this single sample is already enough for you to kind of identify what distribution you're sampling from. And what this allows us to do is it lets you reduce the task of sampling to a statistical estimation problem, namely that of estimation of P itself. Now, the, the second requirement, which is much trickier, is to ensure that each Oracle query only reveals O of one bits of information about the identity of P itself. Okay, and what this does is this gives you a lower bound on the estimation problem. So taken together, these two parts give you an uh, information theoretic lower bound on the, the task of sampling. And this like argument structure is, is pretty standard uh, in, in flow theory, but the, the hard part of course is actually doing this construction. I'll just uh, briefly like flash what this construction looks like. Um, I've plotted here like the second derivative of the potential. Uh, it's oscillating between the minimum and maximum allowable values, which are one in kappa here. And uh, if I integrate this once to plot what the the first derivative of this potential looks like, it would look something like it starts off with one slope and then goes higher and so on. It looks, looks like this uh, staircase shape. And uh, the reason why we need this kind of construction is uh, if you have, this is just like one distribution in the family. Now, if I take another distribution in the family, then it would also like have this staircase shape and it would kind of interlace. And then at some point, 
we, in, we need to make sure that this uh, second distribution agrees exactly with the first distribution. And the reason why we want to do this is we want to make sure that each query to the Oracle doesn't leak too much information about which uh, distribution we're sampling from. Now, I won't be able to say um, much more about the lower bound here. So let me discuss a couple of open questions. So I already discussed this problem of, of the warm start, which we're um, currently investigating. Uh, it'd be interesting to see like if our techniques can be used to analyze other metropolis Hastings algorithms. And another question I find quite interesting is whether we can metropolize other algorithms, in particular non-reversible MCMC. And for lower bounds, the, the main question here is like, what is actually the, the complexity of sampling? Can we take our lower bound in one dimension and extend it to a lower bound in D dimensions, pin down the complexity there, and, and maybe look at the complexity of other classes? This, I think, is uh, sort of a, a key challenge for the field. But uh, so far, like, there hasn't been that much progress, but I'm kind of hopeful that we can make something happen this semester. And uh, I need like a, a quick plug. So I'm co-organizing this uh, complexity of sampling working group here at Simons. We've been meeting on Tuesdays and Fridays. So if any of these like complexity questions I brought up uh, today are of interest to you, then you should, um, I guess like you can email me and I'll, I'll send you like a Zoom link and we can like try to like meet and discuss problems. So we have a, a wiki which contains like recordings of, of previous meetings. And in particular, like this 1D lower bound, I spoke about it in one of these meetings and it's recorded. So if you're uh, curious about learning more of that, you could see the recording there. Yeah, that's, that's all I have. Um, I'll take any other questions you have. So about the lower bound, is this is for any oracle, right? It doesn't use. I, I didn't get exactly what what uh, what are the oracles you're talking about for the lower bound. Um, essentially, our lower bound would apply to any kind of oracle that returns local information about the potential around the the point that you query. For instance, like the value of the potential and like the value of its derivatives and, and so forth. In particular, like it applies to an Oracle that returns the value of the potential, the value of the first derivative and the second derivative at that point. Okay. Yeah. So it doesn't imply, it, it might be much more conservative than, uh, than an Oracle that uses first or first order information, right? So it might be much worse the result for, I'm not quite sure because like the Oracle I'm considering like it, it can return first order information, right? So the Oracle gives you more information. So if you have a lower bound against that, then you have a stronger lower bound. That's what I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Questions? Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, so in the proof, um, the, the previous proof, assuming warm start, where actually you exactly using the warm start in the proof? Uh, where, where did we use the warm start in the proof of Mala? So actually like this entire conductance machinery that I've been talking about, it all like uses warm start. So like uh, maybe a different question to ask would be like in these results that I talked about, about the non-asymptotic results, and they, they actually don't need to assume that you have a warm start. Like how do they not have a warm start assumption? And the reason why is that they, they like um, augment this like conductance machinery with this like with this like extra conductance profile technique. Um, they and like a stronger isoperimetry property of the target distribution. And using these, like what they're able to do is they're, they're able to get a log log dependence on the warm start parameter. If you start off with warm start parameter kappa to the d over two, then this log log dependence on the warm start only introduces extra logarithmic factors in d. But those techniques, uh, we can't really combine them with, with our work because like, actually we have lower bounds against what's possible to do under these things. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank uh, Sinho again.
and the next talk will be in 10 minutes uh, by Kevin Tian. So we'll, we'll come back here at 2.50. Thank you.